Hello, and welcome to the video on laser safety for the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. The purpose of this video is to acquaint you with the basic uh, fundamental hazards of using lasers in the laboratory, as well as with techniques for using lasers safely. It's important to know that lasers are frequently found in material science labs, not simply in labs devoted to lasers or laser material interactions, and they can sometimes be parts of equipment where it's not readily apparent. Therefore, it's important for everyone to have at least a basic working knowledge of laser hazards and how to use lasers safely. Let's start out by reminding ourselves of our basic philosophy regarding safety in material science and engineering labs. In particular, all of the faculty feel very strongly that there is no experiment which is worth putting the life or health of yourself or someone else in danger. And that safety is really the most important aspect of the work that we do. A corollary of this is that we don't undertake any work in labs without prudent consideration of the safety aspects of that work. That is not to say that we let safety overwhelm all other considerations. It's simply that we are prudent in our planning. We take due regard for safety, uh, understanding that safety really is uh, a prime value of what we do. Our goal in safety training and how we approach safety in material science and engineering is that we never have any incidents in which uh, there is uh, any serious uh, effect of health or loss of, obviously loss of life in the laboratory. And then we don't accept any excuses for incidents that do occur. In retrospect, of course, all incidents uh, are foreseeable and, uh, and preventable. Uh, and it's easy to make excuses after the fact. What we try to do is look ahead, uh, examine the sorts of things that we're doing ahead of time so that we can make sure that we're working safely and that we never have uh, any incidents occur at all. In this class, we'll talk about basically three things. We'll talk about classifications of lasers with regard to the kinds of hazards uh, that they produce or the degree of hazard that they produce. We'll talk about the effects that lasers can have on the body, in particular on the eye. And then we'll talk about ways in which we can work safely with lasers involving both uh, engineering controls as well as administrative controls of lasers and laser radiation. Before we talk about classes of lasers and laser hazards, it's worthwhile to spend a second discussing the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is radiation in which the uh, photons or particles have sufficient energy to ionize atoms, that is, remove electrons from atoms, producing radicals, uh, species which are uh, very chemically active. Uh, in this regard, the most common form of ionizing radiation in material science labs are x-rays, uh, but we also sometimes encounter neutrons, alpha particles, gamma rays, uh, or beta rays. Ionizing radiation, of course, is the uh, subject of a different uh, safety video, uh, specifically dealing with x-ray hazards in the lab. Non-ionizing non radiation produces a, a different set of hazards, uh, and this includes things like ultraviolet, visible, and infrared light, microwaves, and magnetic fields. Uh, in this particular course, we're worried about uh, light, both uh, visible UV and IR, in the form of laser radiation. Uh, the hazards there are uh, not due to ionization, but simply due to delivery of energy to the body, to tissues, um, typically resulting in heating, which can result in localized damage. Before we get started with the more detailed part of the presentation, let me just point out that a briefing such as this uh, is necessarily incomplete and can only really hit the highlights of laser safety uh, and how to work safely with lasers and their hazards. If you need more detailed information, you need to seek out additional sources. Uh, and one that I would particularly like to call your attention to is this book, Laser Safety Management, which uh, was authored by uh, a gentleman who is actually the laser safety office officer for the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, that is the biggest laser facility in the world, and you would expect that the laser safety officer at that facility knows what he's talking about. Uh, and this book makes it clear that he does. It's written with um, laser safety officers particularly in mind, but there's lots of good practical information for uh, people working with lasers, including both students and, and principal investigators. There's also a number of case studies uh, examining uh, particular incidents that happened uh, and how those incidents might have been avoided. So if you work with lasers regularly in, in your work, uh, I would really recommend that you seek out this book, which is available in the uh, Eisenhower Library, library and, uh, and take a look at what it has to say. 
Okay, let's talk about laser classifications. Uh, lasers are classified into uh, several classes, five classes. Um, sorry, excuse me, seven classes. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss them in uh, order of increasing level of hazard, starting out with the least dangerous and working our way up to the most dangerous. The least dangerous lasers which we encounter are called class one lasers. Uh, and these are lasers which cannot cause damage to the skin or to the eyes during normal use, uh, either because the intensity, that is the, the power delivered per unit area of the laser is sufficiently low, uh, or because a, layer, a laser of uh, higher power is um, completely enclosed and shielded such that, it, such, such that there is no way for a user to be exposed to dangerous levels of uh, exposure um, during normal use. An example of this kind of laser would be the uh, laser in, say, a DVD player or in a um, supermarket checkout scanner, uh, which are, can be higher powered lasers, but which are enclosed so that there's no way for uh, a user during normal operation to be exposed to the direct beam. Uh, the next class up are class 1M lasers. These are lasers which could be, um, uh, have a relatively large amount of energy, uh, but which produce large diameter or large, uh, highly divergent laser beams um, such that they are safe because they don't concentrate very much energy into a small spot. Um, a caveat, of course, is that you can, of course, take a laser beam such as that uh, and pass it through magnifying optics uh, and produce, a, or demagnifying optics, and produce a very small spot uh, of much greater intensity. So um, it's important to note that you can change the classification of a laser uh, based on how you handle the laser beam. Working our way up the uh, hazard scale, class two lasers are low powered lasers, greater than class one, but still below one milliwatt in power for a continuous as opposed to pulse laser. Uh, class two lasers are safe because even if they, uh, the direct beam shines in your eye, you have a blink reflex, uh, which limits the duration of the exposure and therefore the potential damage uh, to the eye, particularly to the retina. Uh, we should note that uh, only lasers that produce visible light can be class two lasers because of course UV and IR uh, lasers are not visible to the human eye and therefore don't elucidate the, uh, or, or cause the, um, the blink reflex. Uh, class 2M is similar to class 1M. Uh, again, these are uh, higher power lasers which are now safe because of a large spot or, or divergent beam. Um, but again, if you would, were to view it with optics, the optics might produce a much smaller spot that would be more hazardous. And again, class 2M only refers to uh, visible wavelengths. Class 3R lasers are intermediate power lasers up to 5 milliwatts in the visible spectrum for continuous, uh, continuous laser. Uh, and these, again, are safe for, for momentary viewing, uh, except by, uh, by optics that may concentrate the spot. Class 3B lasers are moderate power lasers now up to 500 milliwatts uh, in the visible spectrum for continuous laser. These are now hazardous for direct eye exposure, but diffuse reflections, as opposed to specular or mirror-like reflections, uh, are usually not harmful. Um, but because the direct beam and, uh, and specular or mirror-like reflections can be harmful, uh, we have stricter controls in the use of class 3, 3B lasers. Uh, in particular, eye protection is required when using a class 3B laser, uh, and key switch or safety interlocks are required uh, to uh, prevent unauthorized use of the laser beam. The most hazardous lasers are grouped into class 4. These are very high power lasers with more than 500 milliwatts uh, in a continuous beam. Uh, these are hazardous to view under any circumstances, uh, including both the direct or beam speculative beam and also diffu diffuse reflections. Uh, they pose the potential for damage to the skin, not just to the eye, by burning. They can pose potential fire hazard, uh, and significant controls on the use of class 4 lasers are required. Uh, we should point out that many scientific and industrial lasers fall into this category, and there are class 4 lasers uh, in use in the material science department in the basement of Maryland Hall. Before you enter a lab that uses lasers, you can find out uh, what class lasers are present because we have signs on the doors uh, that warn you to the potential hazard. Uh, so these warning signs are posted uh, and they give an appropriate uh, danger sign, either a caution sign, which is for a relatively low power laser, such as this class two helium neon laser, and the uh, warning simply do not stare into the beam, uh, with the implication being that things like diffuse reflections are not particularly dangerous. Uh, as you go to class 3B or class 4 lasers, uh, the warning signs get a little bit more pointed, uh, indicating danger and not simply caution, uh, and uh, indicating that you should avoid exposure to the beam, 
uh, or avoid exposure to the direct or the scattered radiation in the case of, of class four lasers. So you can know before you walk into a lab what kind of laser hazards um, might be present. With regard to exposure to lasers, uh, an important concept is that, is that of maximum permissible exposure, or MPE limits. And it's simply the level of laser radiation to which a person can be exposed without hazardous effects uh, or biological changes in the eye. Uh, and as you might expect, the MPE then depends on the wavelength, uh, which is going to, for instance, uh, affect where the, uh, the laser radiation is absorbed, particularly in the eye. Uh, it'll depend on the exposure time and the pulse repetition rate for a pulse as opposed to continuous laser. So these are useful for regulations. Um, we should point out, though, that in, in actual use, uh, in common laboratory situations, it's sometimes difficult to estimate the actual exposure to, that you receive to the laser beam. So for instance, if there's a diffuse reflection, uh, say, of a class 3B laser, uh, how much exposure are you actually getting? Um, that is not necessarily easy to determine, uh, and that somewhat limits the usefulness of this idea of a, an MPE, or maximum permissible exposure limit. Okay, let's move on to talking about uh, hazards uh, associated with, uh, with the use of lasers. One of the primary effects that we're concerned about, one of the primary dangers, uh, is the effect of laser radiation on the eye. Uh, and the reason for this is very simple, well, two actually. Uh, the first is that eyes, our eyes are, of course, uniquely valuable to us, uh, and, and the loss of an eye or, or the loss of, uh, of vision in both eyes uh, is obviously of great consequence for the individual affected. Um, the second reason is that unlike other tissues, the eye can actually focus the radiation, the laser radiation, uh, into smaller spots. So it can increase the intensity of the exposure uh, into a very small spot uh, on, in different parts of the eye, but particularly onto the retina, um, by very, very large factors. Uh, and what this means is that even a relatively low power laser, a laser in the milliwatt range, can cause significant damage to the retina uh, if it's focused by the lens. And, and one of the results can be permanent blindness uh, if that laser spot happens to be focused onto the place where the, uh, where the optic nerve uh, enters the retina. In this regard, it's important to point out that your uh, visual perception of the brightness of the radiation uh, laser radiation is not necessarily a good measure uh, of the actual intensity of the exposure that you're receiving. This is particularly true at the extreme ends of the visible spectrum uh, as we shade into the ultraviolet uh, on the one end or the infrared on the other end uh, where the response of your eye may not just not be very strong even though the intensity of the, of the laser radiation uh, might, be, might be quite high. Let's just take a quick look at the anatomy of the eye. Uh, this is uh, just a cross section through the eye. You can imagine uh, laser light or light coming from the top. Uh, the first thing that uh, it enters as it enters the eye is to go through the cornea, uh, then the aqueous humor, and then the lens, which uh, focus the, focuses the radiation, and then so on through the eye uh, until uh, reaching the retina, which is on the back uh, surface of the eye. And here is that point, as I mentioned earlier, where the optic nerve uh, uh, contacts, uh, contacts the retina, and all the visual signals from the entire retina uh, then go out through the optic nerve uh, to the brain, which is why if you burn the spot and damage the optic nerve, uh, even though you maybe damage only a relatively small part of the back of your eye, uh, you can be permanently blind uh, in that eye. Different wavelengths of radiation are absorbed uh, differently as you go through these various structures, in particular in the cornea. Uh, it tends to absorb uh, things not so much in the visible range, but in the ultraviolet and in the IR range, uh, either of which can cause damage. Uh, in the UV range, uh, we can experience what's called welder's flash, which is a photochemical response, which is thankfully usually temporary. Um, but infrared radiation can be absorbed by the cornea, which may cause thermal damage. UVA radiation can be absorbed by the lens. That can cause cataracts uh, or, or opaqueness uh, of the lens. Uh, and then finally, visible light and infrared A are absorbed um, by, by the retina. And as we noted earlier, because they can be focused by the lens, uh, the intensity at a particular spot can be quite high, and that can cause permanent damage due to burning uh, of the retina. We should also be concerned about the effects of laser on skin tissue uh, other than the eye. Um, usually we think of, of skin effects as being less serious um, because uh, the skin, of course, is any one particular small spot on skin is less valuable to us than, uh, than our retina. Um, but that's balanced by the fact that uh, exposure to the skin is actually much more likely than exposure to the eye for several reasons. 
One is simply the exposed skin area is quite, uh, quite a bit larger. Uh, another is that we would tend to reach our hands into the experimental apparatus where we wouldn't usually put our eyes. Uh, and finally, we uh, usually wear, are wearing eye protection for, for hazardous lasers where we're not necessarily covering uh, every exposed part of, uh, part of our skin. So lasers can, uh, can burn the skin. Usually you get some warning of that um, by a sense of warmth. Um, which is uh, different from uh, the damage to your eye, which can happen nearly instantaneously. Um, of the different radiation, different wavelengths of radiation, the most dangerous is uh, UVB, uh, which can cause uh, thermal injury, but can also be carcinogenic. We should also mention non-beam hazards. Uh, laser safety training tends to emphasize the danger of, of laser beams entering the eye, and that's certainly a very significant danger. But if you look at laser accidents that involve loss of life or loss of limb, uh, those are not uh, usually caused by the laser beam. Those are usually caused by other hazards associated with the laser equipment. Uh, and of these, one of the most dangerous are the presence of electrical hazards, particularly high voltages uh, or large capacitors that can store significant amounts of charge and release it uh, very quickly in uh, the form of large currents. There are other hazards as well. Um, for instance, you can have uh, RF fields produced by lasers uh, plasma emissions or UV or visible radiation from the target due to the laser material interaction. Uh, ionizing radiation can also be produced by, by high voltage vacuum tubes. Uh, arc lamps can cause explosions uh, and potential fire hazards. There are chemical hazards from dye lasers. Uh, lasers are often used in conjunction with compressed gases, um, which have their own hazards, which are part of the uh, physical hazards uh, safety briefing. Uh, and finally, where the laser interacts with the target, um, that will uh, um, often cause uh, changes that uh, are often of interest, um, but in, they produce ancillary hazards, such as the production of fumes or vapors from the target that may themselves be hazardous. Okay, let's move on to the last topic of this course, which is how to work safely uh, with lasers. There are a few basic principles that everyone working with lasers should always keep in mind. Uh, and the first and most important is that we never look directly into a laser beam or at a specular that is a mirror-like reflection, regardless of the power of the laser. So you may think of uh, a laser, uh, such as a laser pointer used in a lecture, uh, as being something you know, too low, low power to actually cause damage. Um, but uh, some laser pointers uh, are actually class three lasers, which if you, if you look directly into the main beam, uh, can actually uh, damage, damage your retina. So we never look directly at a laser beam or at a specular uh, or mirror-like reflection. Uh, corollary, corollary of that, of course, is that we then minimize specular reflections um, by the sorts of equipment that we use, but also by our personal apparel. So for instance, it's usually rule in laser labs that there is no reflective jewelry allowed, no uh, wedding rings or rings, no watches, uh, uh, you know, no bracelets, things like that, things that can give rise to inadvertent specular reflections. We use eyewear to protect our eyes, uh, shields to contain the laser beam, and access control to the laser beam as necessary, depending on the particular hazard of the laser. Uh, and we should note that it's important to be particularly careful when you're performing unusual or, or not commonly performed procedures such as alignment. Um, routine operations of lasers uh, can be fairly safe once the, uh, all the, the controls are in place. Um, when you are aligning a laser, then typically you've done something like removed some of the shielding, uh, or change the configuration of the optical components. And those are times when uh, it pays to be particularly careful uh, to where the laser beam is going and where all the reflections uh, are going. In terms of beam control for lasers, we want to terminate the laser beam at the end of its useful path. So once the laser has done whatever it is you want it to do, uh, then you route it into something which will absorb it and, uh, and, and not allow for uh, additional possibilities for exposure. The beam path on an optical table should be located at a level other than eye level, uh, either for people who are standing around the optical table or for people who may be seated, say, at a desk nearby. You want to orient the laser such that the beam is not directed toward doors or aisles, so that uh, someone, for instance, walking by the lab outside, if the door should be, happen to be open, uh, should, would not be exposed. Obviously, the laser should be securely mounted on a, on a stable platform so it doesn't move inadvertently and cause unexpected deflection of the laser beam. You want to confine the primary beam and any potentially dangerous reflections to the optical table itself with appropriate shielding. And you want to clearly identify the beam paths and make sure that those beam paths don't cross any populated areas or traffic paths. Personal protective equipment is very important and for lasers, um, the most obvious uh, 
kind of protective equipment is protective eyewear, uh, which is absolutely necessary for class three and class four laser use whenever irradiation of the eye uh, is possible. It's important to note that laser eyewear is designed to provide protection to a specific range of wavelengths for a fairly obvious reason. If a, uh, eyewear were to be opaque to all wavelengths, then it wouldn't be very useful as eyewear and you'd have trouble working in your lab. Therefore, our laser eyewear is uh, designed to block a particular range of wavelengths but let other wavelengths through so that you can see what you're doing and actually work uh, in the lab. The implication of this is that you have to choose the right kind of eyewear for your particular laser and that the eyewear you choose for one laser may not necessarily be appropriate for a different laser. So the eyewear has to be matched to the wavelength of the laser uh, radiation that you're actually using. Let's just spend a minute now talking about the control measures that we take with uh, regard to laser radiation. These fall into two categories, administrative controls and engineering controls. Administrative controls are things like education and training, which you're taking part in now. Uh, it extends beyond the safety briefing to the training that you receive in the lab from your PI or from the other members of your lab group. Uh, we restrict use of lasers, particularly class three and class four lasers, to authorized personnel who have been properly trained and understand the hazards and how to mitigate those hazards. We wear pr proper protective equipment, particularly laser eyewear, uh, and we post warning signs and labels so that everyone can know the potential hazards that, uh, that may be lurking in the lab. Engineering controls are things that uh, are, are physically part of the equipment. So these include things like access control and the interlocks um, to prevent the laser from being turned on inadvertently. Uh, warning lights, which are typically fail safe so that the laser cannot be turned on if the warning light does not come on simultaneously. Interlocks also typically prevent access to things like uh, high voltage parts of the equipment uh, when they're energized. Uh, and finally, things like beam enclosures to confine the, the direct beam and the specular reflections to the optical table fall into the category of uh, uh, engineering controls. Finally, it's worthwhile looking at uh, cases in which uh, accidents can occur and the factors that can contribute to accidents involving lasers. Uh, and one of the most significant failures uh, is a failure to wear proper laser eye protection. Um, this is very, very important. We can't stre stress this uh, uh, strongly enough, um, or maybe I should say we can't stress it too strongly. Uh, you know, there are many, many, many cases in the literature, uh, case studies, where uh, people receive momentary exposure to hazardous levels of laser radiation at a time when they were not wearing laser uh, eyewear uh, and that uh, damage to the eye, including blindness, resulted. Um, vigilance is absolutely required uh, at all times in the laser lab. The time when you think that you are safe from the laser reflection uh, and you take your, your eyewear off, uh, maybe the time that you actually get exposed. So uh, you need to worry, uh, or not worry, but you need to be uh, always keeping this in mind. Uh, what goes along with that is, of course, you have to pick the proper laser eyewear. You can't pick up any pair of laser glasses or goggles that are in the lab and wear them because they not, may not be appropriate for the laser that, uh, that you're actually using. Uh, every laser eyewear will always have on it uh, an indication of the radiation, the wavelengths uh, over which it provides, provides protection. And you should make sure that that's matched to the laser that you want to use. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, unusual procedures, things like alignment, are times in which uh, unanticipated exposures can occur. So you should um, be particularly vigilant when aligning uh, your equipment. Uh, less common are things like equipment malfunction, failure of interlock, or something like that. Um, Failure to uh, respect and, and properly handle high voltage components of the equipment uh, can also lead to, to accidents. Um, a failure to protect from ancillary hazards, things we talked about earlier, things like uh, laser generated contaminants or, or viewing of the laser generated plasma uh, where the target is. Um, these can also uh, hurt you and so you need to worry about those ancillary hazards as well. And then finally, just generally uh, improper use of the equipment, using equipment in ways in which it was not intended or not designed uh, to operate. So in summary, uh, the take-home message should be that lasers have the potential to cause significant injury, particularly to, particularly to the eye. Uh, we need to be cognizant of that and, uh, and take the appropriate steps to minimize and hopefully eliminate the opportunity for injury, particularly to our eyes. What goes along with that then is the use of proper eye protection is critical when using high powered lasers, class three and class four lasers. Again, you have to make sure that you're using the right kind of protection, the right kind of eyewear for the laser that you're using. Uh, we don't wanna lose 
uh, sight of the fact that uh, lasers pose other hazards as well, such as electrical hazards, so you always need to treat uh, particularly large lasers with, uh, with caution. Uh, and then finally, I'll say that there's no substitute for personal responsibility. Um, in, through this video and also in your training in the lab, uh, you'll be taught about the hazards, you'll be taught about how to minimize the hazards in the right way to uh, conduct your experiments and the right way to work with your equipment. Uh, however, it's impossible for someone to be looking, they're looking over your shoulder all the time, making sure that you're following the procedures that you were taught. Therefore, you have to take it upon yourself as your personal responsibility to make sure that you follow the procedures uh, that you're taught. Uh, you not take shortcuts, uh, you not uh, avoid you know, using eye protection because you, know, you think you're only going to be having the laser on for a second, um, these sorts of things. A uh, corollary of this is if you find yourself in a situation where you don't know something, if you don't know the right way uh, to, uh, to use a particular laser or the right protective measures uh, or so on, you need to ask. You can ask other members of your research group, you can ask the people responsible for the equipment if you're in a different uh, lab other than your own group's lab, you can ask your principal investigator, uh, you can ask the safety officer for the department, it happens to be me. Uh, part of your personal responsibility is not to simply assume that you know how to do something, um, but to ask the right questions and make sure that you know how to deal with things, with things properly. Uh, I can speak, I think, for all the faculty in the Department of Material Science and Engineering when I say that we would f far prefer to have some delay in your experimental work, uh, some setback in, get in terms of getting things done, um, as opposed to rushing ahead without the right information or, with what, or without the right equipment. Uh, and having an accident in which, uh, which someone gets hurt. Uh, none of us ever want to see anyone get hurt in our labs for any reason. That's why we do this training, uh, and that's why we emphasize the importance of personal responsibility uh, in, uh, in all of our laboratory work. That concludes the safety briefing. Uh, and again, uh, I'll just say that uh, if you have any questions about this briefing or about how to work safely with lasers, please ask. Ask your PI, ask me, uh, and we'll make sure that you get the right information. Thank you.